Hello everyone, welcome to Off the Cuff where the headlines come to life. Our guest today is Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Jefferson and he is the subject of the Luft Gangster Memoirs of a Second Class Hero. Welcome. And welcome, welcome, Good. welcome, um, Lieutenant Colonel. What an honor to have you here with us. Thank you for being here. Uh, we also have uh, Mr. Mike Rott, who is the producer of this phenomenal documentary about Lieutenant Colonel Alexander's life and history. And we are going to talk to a hero today who's in our studio. So we're Talk we're very to a survivor, pleased. Jim. Talk to a survivor. <laughs> we're going to be talking to a hero that's here <laughs> in our studio today. Um, we're, we're so excited to have you here. Um, your service um, is phenomenal and your story is phenomenal as Thank well. Um, Mike, I wanted to start off with you just a little bit. Um, you created this documentary um, about the life history and really um, about the Tuskegee Airmen. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, you know, we, we, we talked earlier um, that I'm familiar with it, but when I really understood it and really researched it, it is amazing. So what was the inspiration? Obviously, I, I can see where the inspiration came from, <laughs> but how did this occur, just as a real quick recap? Yeah, so my, my father heard Colonel Jefferson speak at an event, and he said, you know, this man's incredible. We should invite him into the mm. studio, talk to you afterwards. Surely. And um, invited Alex into the studio thinking we were just going to basically interview him real quick and donate the footage to his family and the Smithsonian and the Library of Congress, maybe National Archives, you know, whoever, sure. just to do it because he's Alex and he's right. amazing. <laughs> and what ended up no. happening was as, as Colonel got to talking, we're just like time out your life <laughs> is a movie and everyone in this country and in the world should know about what you went through because it's just so remarkable Thank and that's how it started well that's a remarkable story and <laughs> i'm and, and you 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 see mm -hmm. definitely <coughs> the, the the story there and Good. and the life history and tell us about your experience about being with the tuskegee airmen and about basically volunteering to be part of this. Oh, yeah. um, what was the inspiration What's there? What's the inspiration? Well, first of all, thank you for being here. It's an honor. But there's so much to talk about. Do I talk about the history of Tuskegee Airmen, blacks in aviation, going to combat, World War II, POW life, after POW life, there's so much to talk about. Absolutely. I don't know where to start. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> you 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 are. I mean, we talked a little bit about this off camera. Um, your your history. Uh, your great grandfather was was born That's to right. slaves and um, wanting to serve your country in the passion that you wanted to. What was the inspiration for well, you to want to be part of this? Tell you what, we only have a certain number of minutes. Let me cut it short. <laughs> World War II is going on. Mm -hmm. I'm a black, mm -hmm. I'm a Negro, I'm colored, so forth. There's, there's going to be a draft. If I were drafted as a black man at the age of 19, 20, 21, 22, I'd go to the Army, Navy, Marines, but I would be a buck private, mm -hmm. making $21 a month, mm -hmm. sleeping in a room with a lot of other guys. But at that time, pressure on the Army and the Navy and Air Force, Congress opened up the 99th Fighter Pursuit Squadron, where blacks were given the opportunity to go to pilot training. I was a college graduate, which was necessary because they didn't want any dum-dums. And I was qualified to go to Tuskegee Army Airfield. And during the nine months of training as a pilot, I would receive $75 a month with all the excitement of learning how to fly, which would you take? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> became a pilot. And after graduation, at nine months, put a little gold bar on your collar as a second lieutenant, 
and he made $150 a month with the excitement of flying. It was exciting. I had a ball. World War II. That's another story. But then this, after that, became a Tuskegee Airman. And it was exciting. I knew that we were breaking ground. And we, I survived. You were a POW. That's right. As, in Germany. As, as a combat pilot flying for the 332nd Fighter Group. I had 18 long range missions, a high, high escort, high above the Bell Bombers and, and leaving Italy, flying to Germany. My 19th mission was strafing, where we came down on the ground and strafed radar stations. That's where my plane got hit by ground fire. And I pulled up and bailed out. And as soon as I hit the ground, hit bingo. Parachute, right? Parachuted. <laughs> and there was a German, and I became a POW in Germany. You, you actually said that when you were a POW in Germany, you were treated like an officer and a gentleman. Because at that time, the POW camp had 100,000 American flight officers. 100,000 American flying officers who had been shot down over German-occupied territory. Do the math. Every B-17... Not good in math, but I'll try. <laughs> we'll try. Every B-17 flying over Germany had four officers on board, pilot, co-pilot, navigator, bombardier, and six enlisted men shooting the guns. The United States lost 5,000 B-17s with all the officers. Four times five, five thousand. Forty-five. All right. All these men were in. Well, there were different camps all over Germany. In the camp that I was in, there was a hundred thousand American flying officers, pilots, by bombardiers, and so forth. And we were controlled by the Germans, who respected the Geneva Convention. In 1939, Germany, England, United States got together and sat down and wrote a, an act which said, how do we treat POWs? We put them in a camp, treat them with honor, do not, no beatings, no torture. For officers. For officers. And even though I'm black, I'm an officer, I'm in the camp, bingo. No beatings, no torture. In fact, they knew more about me than I knew about myself. I was interrogated by the German officer. And, and as I walked in, he had a book. And in the book, the front of the book said, 332nd Fighter Group, Negroes, Red Tails. The planes of our planes were painted red for air identification. So when, the, when we joined the bombers, they could see the red tail. They knew exactly who we were. He opened the book, thumbs through it, and I saw the pictures. He said, Lieutenant, isn't that you? My graduation picture. My Lord. At Tuskegee. You know what? We actually have a clip about that. That's so it. So let's, let's, let's roll that clip, um, and we'll talk about it. It was fantastic, just, just being, being there. Let's roll that clip. The interrogator had a big book. On the front of the book, it said, 332nd Fighter Group, Negro, Red Tail. He opened the book and I saw pictures. Pictures of every class before me. I knew all these guys. These are my upperclassmen. Finally, he got my picture and he said, Lieutenant, isn't that you? Here's my class picture. I went to Chatsy High School in Detroit. Had all my marks. Clark College in Atlanta. Had all my marks. Howard University in Washington, D.C. Had all my marks. When I got to Stalag Le 3, Stalag means camp. Luft, L-U-F-T, air. Luftwaffe. Waffe means army. Luftwaffe is the air army. When I got to Stalag Luft three, controlled by the Luftwaffe, the Germans knew everything about every man, relatively. We asked, asked ourselves, why? How? When Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, what did the American government do to the Japanese Americans? 
They insured them. But when Hitler declared war on the United States, what did the American government do to the German Americans? In our midst, nothing. So that was that was a clip of, of your interrogation. So they knew they knew about my high. I, I finished Chatsy High School in Detroit. They had all my marks. I finished from Clark, third grade even. My grade school. I finished Clark College in Atlanta, Georgia. They had all my marks. I finished a year at Howard University in Washington D.C. They had all my marks. Wow. I find out that on all the rest of the men, on the great majority of the men, they're white. The same things had happened to them. And the great question was, why and how? How? Do we have answers to those questions? No specific answers, but some of the assumptions. What did they do to the Japanese Americans after Pearl Harbor? Right. And they interned camps, them. Internment camps. In fact, when Hitler for, uh, declared war on the United States, what did the members of the United States, what did we do to the German Americans in, in this country? Nothing. Absolutely. Because Nothing. they're white. Mm -hmm. You can go downtown to the Board of Education, find out the marks of your children and anybody else's. You can go to the tax office, find out how much taxes you pay on your house, and the guy across the street. We find out that much of this information was seeming back to Germany through German Americans who were part of the system. It's part of the system. But to go back for third grade marks, that's, that's, that's amazing. Um, during your time in the POW mm -hmm. uh, camp, there were, there were things that you actually witnessed as well um, in regards oh, to... Oh, yes. Who, the prisoners there and, and what was happening. So what was your take on that and, and, and how did you interpret that while you were there? We learned to sit the war out and play because we knew that the war was going down. Was We had uh, constructed radios to listen to the BBC at night. We, we learned that the Germans were losing the war. All we had to do was sit there and wait. We watched the progression of the American forces, and especially the Russian. We didn't want the Russian forces to uh, liberate us because we knew about the Russians. That's why we, when the Russians were approaching, the Germans put us out on the road, and we walked 80 kilometers west before they put us on those 40 and 8s to, to, to uh, take us finally to Mooseburn near Munich. But uh, we survived the war. We knew was, the war was going to end, and literally survived the war. When you seen what was happening in the camps, um, you had said that um, mm -hmm. it was we 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 in in Dachau and what in, you witnessed. Well, we we saw Dachau after the war. Okay. After the war, the, the camp that we were in, Mooseburg, seven mm -hmm. A, Mooseburg seven. Stalag 7A, approximately 20 or 30 miles from Mooseburg. We didn't know it then. Remember what now. What was done. No TV, right. no Time magazine, no newspapers. Dachau had not been talked about. We didn't even know it was there. Liberated by General Patton's Third Army. And after that, we're sitting there waiting to get transportation up to La Havre to come back home. And somebody said, there's a place down the road with a lot of dead people. What do you mean dead people? They said, there were. so quite naturally, we got a Jeep. We liberated a Jeep, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> liberated. 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 What, do you, what do you call it in? <laughs> Borrowed. <laughs> Borrowed. <laughs> there's, there's, there's a phrase we use Kindly about. Kindly asked to take. <laughs> we appropriated it. Appropriated. Yeah, to find this place. <laughs> and... After 25 or 30 miles, you start to smell it because the ovens were still warm mm. where they were burning bodies. It was awesome, mind-boggling. I can still see it. You called it man's inhumanity. To Whatever man. you see about the Holocaust, double it, triple it, quadruple it, 
because you cannot understand piles and piles of dead people with the ovens are still warm, half burned. And, uh, very horrible. dark history. Very, very dark time in our history. Exactly. Um, and we, we have a clip um, uh, that, about that as well. Can you set it up for us just a little oh, bit? Oh, sure. I get the shivers whenever I think about it. Wow. Well, we're, we're yeah. going to watch this clip. We're sitting there, somebody said, there's a place down the road with a lot of dead people. What are you talking about? Remember now, no television, no TV, time, no Time magazines, no... Sp we had to find it. My name is Victor Gagne. I'm 93.75 years old. I was in the 12th Armored Division, known as the Hellcat Mystery Division. We was in the 7th and we the 3rd Army. The 3rd Army was with Patton. We was coming in, you know, I was always in the half track. We coming in this area and uh, we see this big sign and the big fence around it and two Germans come out, you know, giving up. And we looked around and we shot them up fast because it looked like a bunch of prisoners inside. We could see a whole bunch of bones and uh, they had a bunch of ovens that were still smoldering. And a bunch of guys come at us, you know, they were nothing but skin and bones. And the rest of them were laying there, half dead. And we tried to feed these guys, and you couldn't feed them because we fed a couple and they died right there. So the medic, the MPs came up and told us to get away from there. So the MPs took over from then on, and the ambulance came through and hauled them away. That was Dachau and Buchenwald. About 20 miles down the road, you could smell it before you got to it, because the ovens were still warm, where there were burning bodies. I saw Dachau. Whatever you see, whatever you've seen, whatever you can think, double it. Horrible. The ovens were still warm with half-burned bodies. Piles and piles and piles of naked dead people. Table 50 feet long, covered with hair, piled up. From gassing the people, before you burn them, you had somebody with a pair of clippers cutting off the hair. Use the hair for seat cushions. Table covered with dentures. Somebody with a pair of pliers pulling out the gold and the amalgam. Table, 25, 30 feet long, just piled high. A room full of shoes. A whole room filled with eyeglasses. Man's inhumanity to man. Mike, in producing this, what was your, what was your take? What was your vision? And, and, and getting into it, did you realize this was that intense and, and that much of, of history? Yeah. Um, when we first started interviewing with Alex, when we got to that subject matter of Dachau. And I have a great uncle who was part of um, Patton's Third Army. He was uh, part of the uh, uh, 12th Armored Division, which was the Hellcats Mystery Division. Mm -hmm. And in the documentary, he speaks, and uh, he was there within 24 hours of you. Because mm -hmm. their claim to fame is that they could move through Germany at 40 miles an hour. That's right. If a town, townspeople waved the white flag, they'd fire a warning shot. If the townspeople waved a white flag, they would send in the infantry to clear the town and they would drive by. If the town fired back, they would just destroy the town and keep, keep rolling by. But uh, so historically it was just, you know, from my family side and, and, and being Jewish and seeing Alex uh, as, a black, yeah. as a black man mm -hmm. being an eyewitness to a hol the Holocaust and everything, it, it just struck me as so important um, Obviously, the stories of the Holocaust, but the stories of the Tuskegee Airmen and civil rights and equality for all people. I feel like in schools nowadays, and we run into this at all of our screenings, we ask kids that have seen the movie at high schools, did you know about the Tuskegee Airmen? Did you know about, oh yeah, I heard of them. You know, but they don't know really the whole roadmap of how things came to be. And without these guys, 
the whole civil rights movement might have been pushed back right. decades. Absolutely. They were, they were excellent. Absolutely. And they completely and, succeeded. And that's what I want to touch upon now, being in Germany and then coming home as coming a home. hero. You came home to some... Coming back home to racism, segregation, and discrimination. Yes. I'm on the boat. I'm on the boat coming out of La Havre. The GIs coming out of France, World War II. Uh, April, May of 45, the war is just over. Coming back home and the ship coming into the harbor of New York with the Statue of Liberty, the flags are waving, the sun, and coming down the gangplank, down the bottom of the gangplank, you have a white soldier saying, whites to the right, niggers to the left. Coming back home to racism and segregation. At that time, all hell breaks loose because Blacks cannot go to the University of Mississippi. Uh, all these schools south of the Mason-Dixon line. We cannot take advantage, south of the Mason-Dixon line, we could not take advantage of the, what's the act of going back to school? Going back See, to school? Yeah, what, what's the act? When you're re retraining or, I mean. After World War II, what? Uh, um, the, okay. veterans, the Veterans Act, of, mm. Veterans Act. Well, all of this is part of the reason why the Civil Rights Movement came about. Why Martin Luther King became available. Why Malcolm X was was talking. All of these things are bring about the uh, 1948 when Truman Executive Order 9981, which desegregated the military. See, before that, the military was segregated. Mm -hmm. We had no black officers in the Navy during World War II. They were all enlisted men. No officers in the Marines. They were all enlisted. Segregated, Mumford Point, trained separately outside the camp. See, that's another thing. Mm -hmm. Just like blacks in the Tuskegee Airmen, separate. So how did you how did you become acclimated back into society after we seeing had, the horrors of war and we coming had back to and, and dealing with with the horrors of racism and stereotypes? Here I've got and, a I've got a master's degree in organic chemistry. I couldn't find a job. Why? Overly qualified. I can still see it. Overly qualified wherever I go. So I became a school teacher. Because I'm married, I got a kid, I got a mortgage, I got a house, I got to make money. But knowing good and well that Tuskegee Gearman and the rest of the black, there were Marines, Navy, there were black women, we all had an influence to give Truman the background to desegregate the military in 1948. The war is over in 45. Desegregate in 40, 48 giving impetus to the rest of the world and to the United States. The background, the Civil Rights Movement, when? Six years later, 1954. Yeah. Desegregation of schools. Martin Luther King and uh, all the rest of the people bringing about the 1954's Supreme Court, Brown, Brown versus the Board of Education. And after that, things happened. So it was a catalyst to a that catalyst. movement, and, 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 and if men like you did not create that entity, and things, our yep. civil rights movement, as Mike said. And the impetus giving women the more, because see, women are still catching so-and-so-and-so -and -so catching hell. But then, it's all part of, part of, part of the world. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, our, our time is up, unfortunately, because I could, I could listen to your stories forever, um, <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel. But uh, I just wanted to make mention of this um, honoring Tuskegee Airmen uh, memoirs of a second class hero. And I know that there's a, there's a website people can go to if they wanted to, um, to, to order this. Uh, yeah, Mike, the, do you know what, yeah. what it is? Mike the, has them. The it? website is www.luftgangstermovie.com. Okay, L-U-F-T gangster.com. 
Luft, Luft Gangster Movie. Luft, Luft Gangster, Gangster Movie. Yeah. If you Google com, Luft we'll, Gangster, we'll, we'll a million up. things will come up. We'll oh, put yes. that up on our screen. iTunes. Beautiful well. documentary. Oh, by the way, Google my name. Yes. Yeah, Google his name. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant Alex, Colonel Alexander Jefferson. Jefferson. Absolutely. Um, amazing stuff. Um, it's certainly been a in the presence of a hero. Thank you. Thank you so much, Colonel, for being here. Thank, Thank you. you for your service. Mike, you did a my man. Magnificent job. <laughs> uh, I love it. He's the guy who put it in. Absolutely. And, and saw thank the foresight so to actually do that and to document such a wonderful history. So thank you both Good. for being here. And thank you for being with us on Off the Cuff. Let's remember our history and move forward in a positive way. We're going to leave you with this last clip of the Luft Gangster Memoirs of a Second Class Hero. We had a, a leader. Colonel Benjamin Oliver Davis, Jr. Let's go through what he did. This is an example. Perseverance. Here's a man who went to West Point for four years. While he was there, nobody spoke to him unless it was official. He'd go to breakfast or Sunday dinner to the end of the table and say, permission to sit down and eat, sir. The other cadets would look at him, denied. He'd have to go to another table, denied. Go to another table. Finally, he found himself off in the corner. This man finished West Point in 1936. He was in the first class to graduate from Tuskegee Army Airfield and slated to be the commander of the 99th Fighter Squadron. Colonel Davis was determined Tall ramrod. By the way, if you're ever in the army, if you've ever been shaken by a full colonel, he would know how to ramrod you up to one side and down the other. He was, he was a tough man, but he was fair and determined. He said, the success of a Tuskegee Airman challenged all the racist attitudes and ultimately led to the integration of the armed forces. And old man Truman had the guts enough to pick up his pen and desegregate the military on the performance of Tuskegee Airmen. Truman had the guts enough to desegregate the military.